you are. Thank you so very much. Uh, and, and Scott and him say, to our Temple Baptist family, for all the kind words, thoughts, food, especially the prayers during the passing of my mom, Maxine Killingsworth. We can't express our gratitude enough to you all, but know that you made a huge impact uh, on our family. We love you all and uh, love Scott, Leanne, and their family. Uh, so just pray for them as they're traveling today. Um, and uh, let me just say a few things to you uh, in regards to just a couple of announcements. Um, let me remind you that, and uh, our guys have been a, a little lenient, and we talked about that, but we need to open the doors at 1030, okay? Uh, if you choose to get here uh, early, starting next week, you're going to have to sit in your car with the air conditioner on, all right? Um, please know that. We need, and this goes for everybody outside of the worship team uh, that has to come in early. Uh, but at 10.30, the doors will open. And so please don't come to the door. Uh, you know, normally we used to say, get here early. And folks would get here late. But now we need you to get here as close to 10.30 as possible. And I know it's warm, so that's why we say sit outside in your air-conditioned cars until the doors open at 6.30. I mean, 10.30. So please help us with that, all right? We need you to do that. Uh, working through some guidelines with that. And... Uh, You've been on uh, Facebook the last few days. You know that Hurley has some uh, cases and some different things, and, and some churches are not meeting today as a result of that, and they've gone offline and everything. And so we need you to uh, adhere to the guidelines, and that's why it's posted on our doors, and our guys feel bad uh, when they're at the back door and you're standing there in the heat. So please help us uh, with that. Uh, uh, we're just asking to do that, and again, that's for the whole, everybody except the worship team that has to get here early uh, to be ready to lead you. So help us with that. That way no, uh, somebody else doesn't feel bad if they come in and people are seated before 1030 uh, because we do have overflow. And uh, if we have to, we've told you, we look for the day that we'll have to go to two services, but we got the overflow ready. It's been ready every Sunday. And then once that, that transpires, then we'll look at going to... Um, two services if we need to, and so we want you just to be aware of all of that, okay? So help us with that starting next Sunday. Again, on Wednesday, we're online at 6.30, um, and uh, that's through Zoom and through Facebook Live. Uh, some of you have been joining in. We need your feedback, what you're hearing, how it's sounding, because uh, we're, we're doing some things to make it sound better, uh, very professional, um, and uh, just getting the help that we need to make it happen and the equipment to be able to do what we've been able uh, to, to do, okay? So praise God for that. Let me just say a few words. Patty's back from her knee replacement this morning over here. Give God a hand. Yep, praise the Lord. Doing good in her first week of, uh, of therapy. And Miss Dot, Miss Helen's sitting right here. And uh, good to see y'all. And uh, I've been able to see Miss Dot and talk to her. And she's been faithful on Zoom. And Miss Helen, you were on there last week. And we noticed that. So those of you who have been logging on, we've, that's been a blessing for that. Uh, Michelle, I saw you guys come in. There's probably some others that I'm missing, but it's good to see you. And to our guests, we're extremely honored and grateful that you're with us this morning. You could be some other places, and you're here. Um, cheering Gordon, good to see you guys. So people are coming back and, and the different things that are happening. And so praise God uh, for all of that. Let me remind you about online giving this morning. Um, go to the website. TempleBaptistMossPoint.com, give icon, you can give there. Uh, if you're in the worship service, you can give through the church app, church center app. Uh, search for Temple and it's there. Or you can text GIVE, G-I-V-E, or HELP, H-E-L-P, to 84321, 84321. And you can give in that manner. Um, and those are the ways that we're encouraging you to give. Uh, there are offering boxes at the entrances and the exits. Uh, there are lock boxes. You'll see those acrylic boxes there. Uh, you can drop yours in there if you would like to. And uh, But online giving, we're encouraging you to move to that. Let me just say to those that are listening online, some of you have never met us, and you're giving to the work of the Lord. And, I, I, you know, we don't take that lightly. And so I want to uh, say thank you for those who have listened. And even though you don't even know us, you've been giving. And uh, we were talking about that in the office this week. What a blessing you have been. And even through the midst of the virus, it's caused many of us in churches to be able to branch out and push some buttons that we needed pushing a long time ago that were able to touch the world. 
And uh, so that's happening. And, uh, you know, we got folks in different states listening this morning um, and, and in different countries that people are listening this morning. And so it blesses me, and we need your feedback. So help me with that. Uh, just in reminder of prayer, let me just say to you, Patty, I had her down this morning and just continue to pray she does her therapy. Miss Nancy Hall, Miss Nancy had her knee replacement, and uh, she's behind Patty on her recovery, but just pray for her. And then uh, James will be going on uh, July the 6th uh, to Shriners, and then on the 7th will be the pre-admit, and then on early on the 8th of July, uh, then he will have that surgery. And so I need you to be praying. We're going to have to do some things there that, to get ready, and I want you to be praying for him uh, and that surgery and the nervousness of all of that, and Carol's been in touch with Shriners. I want you to start now bathing that process in prayer. I uh, asked you last week to do that. And then one other one that you do not know, but I got a special uh, request. I uh, saw it this morning. Some friends that go way back with Selena and I, Keith and Dale Allred. Uh, Keith uh, had a stroke, a major stroke, some months ago. You guys were praying for him, recovered from that stroke, went through rehab, got out of rehab, and then Keith apparently had a heart attack last night. And uh, he's been moved to St. D. in Jackson. And uh, Dale just uh, sent some messages, and sweet, sweet couple. And uh, just, just be praying. I know you don't know him, but him and Dale go a long ways back to us and with us and our family. And so I ask you to be praying uh, for them uh, as they walk through this journey, okay? So that's just some things out there this morning. Again, some restrictions are in place. We're allowing you to stand and do all that this morning. And so as we continue to relax a little bit, We'll let you know on that, but thank you so much for your faithfulness. I can't say enough about that. Our, our praise team, Heather's out this morning. She's up visiting with her grandparents, but uh, just uh, thank you for these folks who come in early. Thank you for Stephen coming in and helping us. Brad and Patrick on the back back there helping, and, and Brad stepped in in a very crucial, crucial time, and Patrick as well. And uh, We've done some things to make uh, worship happen in some different ways, and Stephen stepped in and helped us. And you don't have to, this guy's from Mobile. And uh, he's done that. So I appreciate him so much. You stand and sing with them this morning as they lead us. Guys, take it. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't. God, I serve knows only how to triumph, and my God will never fail. Yes, my God will never fail. Cause I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. favorite line. Every war he wages, he will win. No, I'm not backing down from any giant, because I know how my story ends. I know how this story ends. So I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory.
take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. Yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for Twenty-seven, verse number 14 is one of my Psalm 27 in general is a, a fantastic chapter but verse 14 we're talking about seeing a victory right I'm going to see a victory that's faith it's not in the victory that you have faith it's knowing that the victory is around the corner knowing that we're going to have the victory, knowing that I'm going to see a victory, that no matter the circumstance, God is going to get the glory and he's going to do for your greater good, always for your greater good and his glory. Those are the purposes. And so in Psalm 27, verse 14, it says, wait for the Lord. It says, be strong and let your heart take courage. Your heart wants to take you a lot of places. But the psalmist says, let your heart, let it take courage. Let courage settle into your heart. It says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. If you will wait on the Lord, I promise, it might be six years. It might be seven years. It might be ten years. But you're going to see a victory. Been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. You got pain.
all know this one. Help us. The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest any face for a world of lost sinners was. rugged cross. It's got to be the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You cannot have any of those parts without the other. It doesn't work. If you have the burial and the resurrection, there's no sacrifice. There's no blood that was shed. If you have the death and the burial, there's no resurrection. There's no victory. It's got to be the death the burial, and the resurrection. All of them together. You cannot have one without the other. It's not just the cross or just the resurrection. It's all of it. That's the gospel. For a world of lost sinners, Jesus was slain. God, we thank you so much. We embrace that. 
We embrace that. That's our Christian uh, approach. Is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, who is rich in mercy, with his great love, came in and saved us and set us free. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Can't do it on our own. We need Jesus. Can't live the Christian life. We need Jesus. God, when we sing songs like Sea of Victory and Chain Breaker and Old Rugged Cross, God, I, I get so excited because it's just an, it's an expression of my worship. It's an expression of my faith. A biblical uh, expression. Every human being uses outward expression for inner feelings. Every single one of us do it. Everyone. And so, God, I, I just sometimes can't even contain the outer expression because of the inner joy and, and happiness that I feel of what you've done. Some people do a really good job at containing that. I can't. So, God, I, I just pray that you would just help us just really dive in. How can we reach the world if we can't even worship? God, I pray that you would teach me how to grow personally, how to develop, and how to be the person that you have specifically called me to be. That is my prayer this morning. God, I pray that you would touch and you would bless as we continue in Jesus' name. Be with us, man. Oh, what a great time this morning. Good way to end that. Old rugged cross. Uh, chain breaker. Cross is the answer. Breaks the chain. And if you're in bondage this morning, if you're listening by Facebook this morning or in the building this morning or whatever, uh, Jesus is the answer. He is that chain breaker. Acts chapter 8 this morning. Randy, I see you and Serena back there, man. Thank you for the post this morning. If you didn't see Randy's post, it was in... Romans 13 there, and uh, followed up with some stuff. And so praise God for that, man. Thank you. I read it this morning. And pray for them guys, uh, law enforcement and Serena in the medical field. Thank God for that family. And uh, pray for them and the people that they influence as well. Last week we talked about challenges. Challenges before the church. Okay, and I, I talked with you about several major things there. Of Acts chapter 8, verse 4 dealing with that specific verse. I want to develop that thought just a little bit further this morning from the standpoint of challenge presents opportunity. Um, and I want us to look at that passage, and then I want to um, make some comments about it this morning. And, uh, you know, as, as believers, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're some perilous times. People are, are afraid. There's great... I mean, you can't even uh, turn the TV on or really even talk to anyone without the, the, somebody bringing up the fact of being afraid and the fear and the motion of it. And I've told you, your Pastor, I kind of take a little bit different approach from other people because some people say, well, you're not supposed to fear. But when I look at the Word of God, we see fear over and over again, but it's how we respond to the fear. When you go into to Psalm and you begin to look at Psalm 56 there in verse 3, the psalmist writes and he says, look, when you fear, run to God, trust in God. And that's where you and I, because fear is an emotion. I mean, I would think if you're honest this morning, there's been times where you've been afraid or, or somebody scared you. And for a moment you feared. Uh, there was fear there. And uh, in the situations to where we are uh, and, and developing ourselves in the midst of change, uh, there's an element of fear there. Culture, I talked to you in depth about that last week about doctrine and the challenges that we face there along with communication and the things that we're having to do. So the New Testament church of the Bible, and when we read that, we know that it faced the challenges, and then we know that it overcame. And in the midst of the day, you and I, are, we face those challenges. Uh, many are the same. May, many are elevated because of the life to which we live. But I say to you this morning, Christian, to the church, to those that are listening, with God, we will overcome. We will. And, uh, and we're going to be stronger as a result of the challenges that we face. 
Um, and, and so I want you to hold on to those truths in the midst of uncertainty uh, and, and all that's going on. And, and thank you for tuning in. And I pray that you're encouraged and, and listening to the Lord on a day-to-day -day basis of what he's trying to say. Uh, so I want you to look with me at Acts chapter 8 this morning. It's in the midst of the persecuted church. Um, Saul, who became Paul, is in the midst of great persecution. And uh, the, 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 the disciples have chosen the seven, and they're doing ministry in the midst of difficult times, okay? And so several verses that I want to give you this morning. It's a little bit long, but try to hang with me. Begin in verse 5, chapter 8. And Philip... And this Philip is not the apostle, okay? I'm going to say more about who he is in just a moment. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria, uh, Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. That's key for us. And the multitudes with, uh, with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them. This is... Uh, demons, if you will, unclean spirits, demons. They were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many uh, who had been paralyzed and lame were being healed. And there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there was a certain man named Simon the, who was formerly uh, practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they... Uh, they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had a, for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. Let me say a word to you. If you're in it for your self-proclamation, if you're in it for your self-glory, you're in it for the wrong reason. You need to check in with the Lord because there's something wrong with your uh, attitude your action, and your aim. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But when they believed Philip preaching uh, the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike, and even Simon himself believed. Now, I want you to think just what you just read, okay? Simon himself, Simon the magician, believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was amazed, constantly amazed. Verse 14, now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard the, that Samaria had received the word of God, remember now Samaria was the home of the half-breeds, all right? The Jews uh, looked at them because the Jews that were left there after the Assyrians came in had married into the Samaritans and they had formed a mixed breed. And so they kind of looked down on them. But now God was moving. So... Uh, they heard about it, the apostles, and they sent Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he, that is the Holy Spirit, had not yet fallen upon any of them. Now, Pentecost had taken place, but it was different than what it was today in our time. And so the Holy Spirit had not come on them, and here, here's the apostles going and laying hands upon them. Um, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed, now here's your difference. Remember, now he believed back up there in verse 13. Simon saw the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands. He offered them money. You ought to underline that, because so many people are trying to buy the way to heaven today. Saying, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands, see this self-glorification, Everyone I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter, bold Peter, here's what he said. May your silver perish with you. May your money perish with you because you thought you could attain the gift of God with money. You have no part, no portion in this matter. What does that word matter mean? Teaching. You have no part in the teaching. You don't understand what's taking place. You don't understand the word of God. For your heart is not right. We need to hear that. It's not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that the Lord, uh, the, pray to the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are the gall, listen, the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity, in the bondage of sin. 
uh, in the stronghold of the things of the world. But Simon answered and said, you pray to the Lord for me, yourselves, really is what he's saying. Pray to the Lord for me, yourselves, you pray for me, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon. Powerful word right there. Let's go to the Lord. God, I pray, open our eyes and ears, God, spiritually, that we may dive into the depths of what you have for us, God, that so many people who are living on the surface would desire to go deeper and deeper in their relationship with you, Lord. I pray that we would hear from heaven today, from the power of the Holy Spirit of God, that we would hear and then we would turn from our wicked ways, that we would turn from our worldliness and turn unto Jesus Christ who is the one who changes lives. God, help us this morning, I pray, in Christ's name, amen. Patrick, if you can pull up that map for me, please do so. I've asked him on late notice to pull up a map because I want you to see something, and you may not be able to see from where you are, but I want you to understand something. Let me get on my handy-dandy thing, and you guys watching from home here. When you look at it, when it says, uh, let's see if I can get over here, and I may not get even see this in Jerusalem. Uh, let me find it. There's Jerusalem right there, okay? So Jerusalem on that side, uh, it's in the same place, but it's sitting right in that area right there. And so when it says in the Bible that they went down from Jerusalem to Samaria, you and I are going to be thinking, well, I'm going down to the beach. I'm going down to Florida. I'm going south. But oh, when you look at the map, which way is he going? He's going north. He's going north up to Jerusalem. So what does that mean? There's two things it means, and I want you to understand this this morning because it's important. In the midst of Jerusalem, I didn't know that until we went there last year that Jerusalem is the same elevation as Denver, Colorado. Actually, a little bit higher than Denver, Colorado. And so when you think about Jerusalem, uh, Philip was going down to Samaria, okay? going from the place on high down in elevation. So he was going down. So it would be like going from the mountains of Tennessee down to the flatlands of Mississippi, all right? Uh, only except we're going south, but they were going north. But there's another reason that I want you to understand this, and many of you know, uh, but the fact is Jerusalem's considered what? The holy city, right? The holy city, the place of Jerusalem. And so it, even today, unto Jews, it's the holy city. How are they buried over there, facing Jerusalem? How are we buried over here? Facing what? East, all right? Doesn't matter over there. You've got to face Jerusalem because it's the holy city. So they're going from the high place in Jerusalem down to Samaria. Think in terms of this. Samaria, uh, Samaria was full of, the time it was... Uh, uh, called Samaria or the Samaritans, which was the Jews that had intermingled uh, with the Assyrians that formed the half-breeds of Samaria, which is the Samaritans. So when you see about that, and we got to see the road, the Jericho Road and all of that this past year uh, went there. And so I want you to think in terms of that. When you read that, Jerusalem, the holy city, going down to the land of nowhere. Now, I'm telling you, some of us need to get off the holy city and go down to the land of nowhere and minister to folk. That's what was happening right there. That's what was taking place. And then you read uh, in just a little bit later, and we're not going to probably get this far today, uh, when you go on into verse 25, Philip was told to go, lost my map. But anyway, he went from Samaria, there it is, went from Samaria down to Gaza. There's Gaza right there, okay? Samaria's up here. So when you look at over here on this side, it's in the same place. Samaria's right up there, and then there's Gaza right there. And here's another thing you read. I don't want you to miss it. In Gaza, God did a work in Philip's life, right? He, that's where he met the eunuch on the way down. When it says he took the desert road, guess what? He had to come through Samaria, uh, from Samaria down through Jerusalem down to Gaza. That's the desert road, okay? And down along the desert roads where he met the uh, eunuch, where had the eunuch been? At the holy city. Where was he going? Home. Where was he from? Ethiopia, which is today part of Sudan, North Sudan. And so when you think about that, um, Philip met him, and he went down, and he was headed to Gaza. And then after he met him, the word of God says that he disappeared. And where did he arrive at? Ashdod. Right there. 
Ashdod. Um, that's, where he, that's where he arrived at. When he disappeared from Philip, and if you even look at Gaza, that's 15 miles away, but we don't really know exactly where he was, but it's probably 15 miles away that he disappeared. How would you like to disappear from here and then wake up 15 miles somewhere? That's exactly what happened to him. And so that just gives you a little picture of what we're talking about this morning, about the, when, when he says that they went down to the city of Samaria. They went down and, and then went from Samaria to Gaza through the desert road, how he had to come back through Jerusalem. Also, when you think about that, Jesus went to Samaria and he could have went way around. I mean, on, when he was headed to Galilee, uh, which is up in the top part, I'd ask Patrick to do that for me that I didn't show you. You got three different areas of, Jeru of Israel. Galilee's in the top. There's the border for Galilee. And you got upper Galilee and lower Galilee. And then you got Samaria. And then you got Judea. Those are the three uh, regions, if you will. Uh, Galilee right there, um, the Samaria region, and then Judea. And when Jer and Jesus went from Jerusalem, he was headed to Galilee. And when he went through Samaria, most of them would go the long way around. But Jesus went through Samaria because he had an appointment with the Samaritan woman at the well. And, and so there you a little bit of short history there for you. And hopefully you can see that online at home as well. But to think about it today, the challenge that you and I face, think about the challenges of that day. It wasn't just hop in your car and be there in a few minutes. You had to get on your donkey, or you had to put your sandals on, or you ended up with your bare feet, and you had to go a little ways to get where you were going. And you had to go through some rough territory. But I want to challenge you this morning. I want you to make a note, Romans 12, 21 says to you and I, Paul talks to the church at Rome there, says, do not be overcome. Uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I'm telling you, we need to be about the good. You and I as Christian brothers and sisters need to be about the good. Let me just say this. I didn't intend to, but I read it before I came in. Bless her sweetheart, Kimberly Williams, Josh and Amanda's daughter, Kimberly, put a thing on Facebook this morning. And, you know, I didn't even realize until a few weeks ago that she was a waitress down at, at Cracker Barrel. And she just put a thing on it. She said, you know, I don't usually post stuff. But she said, here's the deal. Be kind to your waitress today. She said, we're working shorthanded, and we got people that don't come in. And said, you know, we need you to be kind to us. And then she says this. Don't forget to tip. Don't forget to tip, or we depend on that. And I just responded back to her the same thing that I tell you. And you can go and look it on there. That we ought to tip 20%, which is more than most of us give to the church. All right? But we ought to tip 20%. And you don't tip based on your service. You don't tip based on your food. You tip based on your love Jesus Christ. And you want to bless that service. That's what you tip for. I don't care if you get in this burn. I don't care if it's dried up. If it's in microwave six hours and you get it. Tip them anyway. You don't go about your business. But make sure that you love that waitress or you love that waiter. And so just uh, a little extra there, a little dessert. But when you think about that, do not, uh, let the, 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 do not be overcome by evil this morning, uh, but overcome evil with good. The word the, um, overcome there literally means not to allow yourself to be overtaken. And I'm telling you, I'm convinced today that we're allowing ourselves, and many who are Christian are allowing themselves to get caught up in stuff that we don't even need to be a part of. And we need to bring it back, and we need to focus on the challenges that are there. That's why I said this morning in that title that challenges present opportunities. Challenges present opportunities. And, and you and I are challenged throughout the Word of God as believers to be overcomers. Why? Because is our focus and we live in the power of the Holy Spirit of God and when we do that we will overcome I don't want you to be like Simon where he wanted to buy his way through I want you to have a genuine relationship I mean that, that we understand that we seize the current opportunities to we that we have and, and re, uh, being reminded this morning I said a moment ago and I said to you again Philip is not Philip the Apostle if you go back uh, just a few chapters earlier, you'll find where they chose uh, the seven. 
And they chose them to be waiters, to, to take care of the tables. It's where we get our term deacons today, to go and serve. And, and Philip was one of those seven uh, in chapter 6, verse 3. And it says how they were chosen, the fact that they were of good reputation, that they were full of the Holy Spirit of God, that they were full of wisdom. And here's the thing about Philip. He was a Greek-speaking Jew, all right? And so when you think about that, what rises to the top with me and what I want us to think about this morning is that we seize the opportunity and we dwell on the fact that we ought to be full of the Holy Spirit of God, that we ought to be full of the wisdom of God, that we ought to desire what God desires, and then everything builds itself around God in our life, whatever we do. Uh, so I want to talk to you this morning. I want to give you three words to hold on to. You've got them in your notes. Uh, you can take them with you. And by the way, um, North... North Point uh, this week, uh, Andy Stanley's church. Many of you know and listen to Dr. Charles Stanley. Great, great man of God in Southern Baptist life. Christian him. Um, just a great guy. But Andy Stanley's church, North Point, put a thing there this week. And it just said, don't settle for Christian. Don't settle for Christian. Isn't that what we do most of the time? Somebody said, well, I'm a Christian. How you know Philip would have said he was a Christian. But he was trying to buy the accolades of God. Paul And Peter turned around and told him, he said, man, you're full of bitterness. You missed the word. And I'm telling you, we misused that word. It was misused in the New Testament day. Certainly is it misused today. And we'll take somebody's word and we'll say, well, I'm a Christian. Are you? How do you know that? Tell me about it. Most of them are going to give a work salvation. Or they'll say, well, you know what? I was raised in a good home. My mom and dad were good. My grandparents were good. My, my granddaddy was a preacher. My, my, my grandmother taught Sunday school. I went to GAs and I went to RAs and I grew up in the midst of all of that. Who cares? Those accolades and a dollar might get you a cup of coffee. What does it mean to be a Christian? Because I'm telling you, there's people sitting in buildings, there's people listening to us today by, by internet and social media that are relying on mama's salvation or granddaddy's salvation or the fact that they were in GAs or RAs or mission friends or they sang in the choir. They went to Sunday school and had perfect attendance for 20 years. And they're going to burn the doors of hell wide open. Going to burn. Going to burn. Because of the same thing, Simon missed it. That's why I wanted you to see there from the standpoint that he listened. He was astonished. The Word of God says in verse 13 that he, he observed the signs. He observed the miracles. And he was amazed. But it came down and it said then he wanted to buy the gift of God. Listen, you can't buy the free gift of eternal life. That's Jesus Christ and he gave it to us. So I want to give you these three words. When you think about don't settle for Christian, when you, don't, when you think about challenge and presenting the opportunity, when you think about really seizing the opportunity, attitude. Attitude. What, what is our attitude this morning? What is your attitude? Here's the, the, the first word that I want you to understand is you choose your attitude. Philip had an opportunity there, and he, he seized the opportunity, and he chose his attitude. Simon also chose his attitude. What, what is, how does attitude? Webster defines attitude as a settled way of thinking about someone. A settled way uh, of thinking about uh, something. Uh, it's a spoken word, or it can be communicated through body language. This attitude that we, we, we have to be careful with. And we think about overcoming evil with good. It has as much to do with our attitude. It has much to do with how we act. And, and when Philip went down to Samaria, I mean, when you look back there, it says that there was great persecution. Uh, Saul was the one leading it. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. I mean, when you think about that, it is real. 
those three regions that I gave you in Galilee in the north, Samaria in the middle, Judea in the south. And Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom until the Assyrians conquered it in 722 B.C. And then they mixed with the Jews, and, and, and that's where the Samaritan race came from. And here's the deal. We're dealing with racism today and sin and all that. Call it anything you want. But they got racism there. And the Jews hated the Samaritans. Why? Because they were mixed. It's the only reason. Because they were mixed. And they had to deal with that. And that's why Jesus, when the disciples saw Jesus at the Samaritan, uh, at the well in Samaria with the Samaritan woman, they questioned him, what in the world was he doing? With a woman? With a Samaritan? And Jesus said, Spoke it. He seized the opportunity. And I'm telling you this morning, church, you and I need to seize the opportunity that our attitude and everything about the attitude is what matters. Our, our reputation. That we're of good reputation. That we're of a godly reputation. Right, take that a step further. We're a godly, obedient reputation. We're full of the wisdom of God. We're full of the Holy Spirit of God. We're in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're leading with that and living with that. And, and Philip was in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we read this morning. And we've got to believe the Word of God when we look at what God was doing. I mean, Philip had the people amazed. They were, they were simply amazed. And in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of the challenges, Philip was faithful. Philippians 2.5, Paul writes from the standpoint of developing the mind of Christ. Developing the, the attitude of Christ. Can, can I tell you this? The moment you're saved, your mind is not where it needs to be yet. Your attitude is not where it needs to be yet. But you've got to be open for God to deal with you. And you've got vices in your life. You got to let God deal with it. The Word of God, there it is on the screen. Have this attitude, have this mind uh, in you that is in Christ Jesus. That's <laughs> what He's telling us there that we develop that mind and that attitude and we serve and love, listen, out of the concern for others. When, when those two greatest commandments that we've talked about so much love God and then love others, the common denominator there is love. God loved us so much that he sent Jesus. And he told us as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And guys, I want to tell you, you can't do that in the flesh. You've got to do it in Jesus Christ. And the same for each one of us. Let the attitude of Christ, let the mind of Christ we serve out of attitudes and love and concern for others and, and for God. What does that attitude do? It always looks to glorify God. Always. It looks to glorify God. And, and, and ch choosing your attitude. Do you know you choose that attitude when you get up every morning and then you choose it many times throughout the day? Choose your just like I was talking about about Kimberly's post, you choose your attitude before you ever go sit at the table. You choose your attitude before you ever order your food. And you just say, God, I want to glorify you. No matter the cost, God, I want to honor you. Attitude. Number two word, actions. Actions. You choose who you follow talked a little bit about this. If you didn't hear Wednesday night, I invite you to go back and look to Wednesday night. Last Wednesday night, I, I, I spoke to you from the standpoint of the victorious life, and, and I want you to think about that from that standpoint, but our, here, here's the deal. Our attitude is reflected in our actions. It's reflected in our lifestyle. Did you see what happened to, to, to Simon? He believed, according to verse 13, he, he realized what was going place, uh, uh, what was taking place, he was constantly amazed. But then because of the bondage, because of the bitterness, because of everything, he wanted to buy the gift of God for his glory. So his attitude and his actions 
didn't match. And I'm telling you this morning, we choose who we follow. And I want to ask you this morning, does our actions match our attitude? Do they match? Do they, do they come together? Give me a verse, Pastor. Psalms 1914. Psalms 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart really there glorify you, O Lord, but be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, the words of my mouth, the, 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 the meditation of my heart, that it all matches. My attitude and my actions, they match unto the words of God so that we can seize the opportunity when the challenge comes. That we'll do what God called us to do, not what our stinking flesh wants to do. I say I am in Christ. I am a little Christ. I am a little follower of Christ. I am a Christian. So therefore, everything that I say and do should match what I say that I am in Christ. That's why it does us good to evaluate our life at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day. Pray over it that God would guard our actions, that God would guard our mindset. For Philip, his life spoke the priority. And then you turn it around into Simon. It spoke his passion. You tell me you love Jesus. If I tell you I love Jesus, my actions should show. They got to show it. If I'm going to be in relationship with Jesus Christ, they've got to show it. And, and this past Wednesday, I talked to you from the standpoint of what it takes. And some of you text me back because here it is. Let me just give it to you real quick. When we talk about living victoriously, there's not a person in here, not a person listening online that does not want to live the victorious life. That does not want to, to hear God say, well done. Well, if you're going to do that, then there's some things that's got to happen. And for some of us, we need to change the old way of life. Really for all of us. You got to get away from the old way of life. You got to move away from it. Some of that involves acquaintances, people. Some of it involves selling your home and moving. Against everybody's wishes. Sell your home, get out of there, get to a healthy place. Some of it involves changing jobs. You get away from the old way of life. Whatever it takes, you got to do it. If you're going to have victory in Jesus, if you're going to seize the opportunity, if you're going to take the challenge and take it to a next level, change your way of life. Number two is prayer. We're spiritually bankrupt many of our lives individually and families because we don't ever pray. We never pray. Something as simple as I love God. God, I, I thank you for loving me. Now I lay me down to sleep. I just never pray. And prayer needs to be a process. When, when was the last time you and God talked in prayer? When was the last time? I mean, really had a conversation. And then the other ones read your Bible. If you want to have victory, the song that we sang, Victory, Jesus Christ opens it up to us. But those three things need to be evident in our life. And Philip's action matched his love for God. I love what it says when it said there in verse 6, the multitude. The multitude with one accord were giving him praise. Because Philip Philip, God was using Philip to move amongst the people. They saw, they heard, they evidenced, they realized what was taking place. And when we say that actions really do speak louder than words, they do. Be careful who you hang out with. I spoke to one of our folks the other day, and I was just talking to him. I said, you know, what you got to do is you got to tell the truth. You, you got to live the truth. 
How, how can we expect the, the blessing of God when we're not willing to speak the truth? How, you know, well, I want to fudge a little. Where do you find that? How can God bless it when you fudge? Some of us this morning in the sound of my voice are, are fudgy. We're living a lie. And we may find ourselves like Simon to where we're in the midst of bitterness and in the bondage of sin. And the challenges were presenting themselves and, and God worked it through. Let me just kind of speed it up. A few other things, but I know our time's moving. The third word is and. And, three-letter word. Attitude, action, and aim. Where does that come from? I want to ask you this morning. Where are you aiming your life? What do you desire? What's your priority? See, when we look at Philip's life, I want to bring it back to the scripture because the word of God says that these guys were chosen because of their wisdom, because of their reputation, because they were full of the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and, and great persecution arose, and then they were scattered. Man, this virus has scattered us. The economy has scattered us. The things of life have scattered us. Where's your aim? If Philip's aim did not match up to the things of God, where would he be? He'd probably be like old Simon, mixed up. That's where so many of our folks are today. That we're, we're not aiming for the things of God. We're not aiming to glorify what's best with, with God. We're not aiming to bless others. It breaks my heart. I hear people and people say, well, I'm sick of this, or I'm... I'm tired or this, and, and, and I'm, I'm ticked off. Some people use some other language. And I want to say, seize the opportunity. If we're believers, seize the opportunity. If we're not a believer, then I can see we're getting ticked off because we don't like where the things are going. If we're caught up in the things that, and we're focusing on our money and we're focusing on our wealth and we're focusing on our health, and we're focusing on everything else other than God. I can see where we can get ticked off. But we look at what Philip represents for us in those seven, in those apostles, when it comes down to obedience and accountability. I love the fact that we always have people question accountability. But it's interesting, and, and, and I, I know churches that don't want accountability, and I know people that don't want accountability. And, and, and interesting in verse 14, you ought to mark it because it says, when the apostles in Jerusalem, who started the church? The Lord Jesus Christ was the head of the church, and then he gave it to the apostles, which delivered the message, and the church began to grow. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who came down, prayed over them, and followed through in the reception of the Holy Spirit of God. Accountability. They wanted to go check it out to make sure things were happening. It's okay to be accountable. We ought to be accountable. And when you look at that, Philip had an aim. And his bullseye was Jesus Christ, was God. On the other hand, Simon, the magician, looking at his personal benefit. Wanted to buy the gift. Wanted to be able to go and get the glory by touching others' lives. And I want you to understand something. No amount of money is going to buy peace, prosperity in heaven. Ain't going to buy it. Not going to do it. It's not going to buy protection. That's what bothers me about some of our folks that listen to different ones. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you follow. Be careful what you read. The networks that you turn to, and, and they tell you, if you send me this money, I'm going to send you this, and you're going to be blessed by this. And if you'll send this much money, you're going to receive this much. Come on now, be careful who you listen to. Probably need to come back and preach that in a later date. Word of God says that we put our trust 
in him and let him be our answer and when the challenges come that we look for his guidance and we look for the opportunity and we seize the opportunity with God gaining the benefit and I'm just going to tell you this morning it's not going to get any better read the book if Jesus Christ tarried going to get a hold of you. And how we deal with the challenges. I'm so overjoyed about our grandkids coming, these new three babies, and the little ones that we have. Some of you that have little ones and are expecting little ones. But the concern I have in my mind is what are we going to do? How's the world going to respond? What's going to happen? And you and I as the church of today need to seize the opportunity. And we need to base the foundation on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing. I had this conversation with several people this week. Jesus plus something. And nothing. If somebody tells you it's Jesus plus something, they're wrong. The Bible doesn't say that. It's Jesus plus nothing. And then God gives us a mind to think and to set foundations. And yeah, sometimes we've got to to work within the confines and the workings of the Word of God and deal with it in the way that is. And it may not be pleasant to us, but I'm telling you when it comes down to it, you and I need to be able to stand before the Lord and know that we've been obedient in our actions. So I ask you today as I wrap it up, what does your action say? What are you trying to accomplish? What, what is your aim? What about the attitude that you have? We know that Philip was a man full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We know that he was ready to go. We know that he was ready to serve. I mean, after he went from Jerusalem to Samaria, and then you find there in verse 25, and go read that. The word of God came to him and said, look, you need to go to Gaza. <laughs> Good stretch. Go down the desert road, too. There were some specific instructions. I want you to understand something today as we get ready for the invitation. The fact that uh, God's got an appointment for you. And it may be this afternoon. And it may be this in the morning. And it may be one day this week that God's going to have an appointment for everybody who's in here and everybody who's listening in the sound of my voice. So it's going to be an appointment time. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to... Present yourself with your attitude, with your action, with your focus, with your aim, full of the Holy Spirit of God. In the midst of this craziness, <laughs> in the midst of all that's taking place, I pray that we have a common goal. This praise team makes their way to the platform. Common goal is glorifying God that we check our attitudes. During this invitation time this morning, wherever you're listening from, maybe you're driving, check your attitude. Check that attitude. Check, check, evaluate your actions. How'd you respond this week? Is there somebody you need to go back and apologize to? Maybe there's some apologies to God. What, what is our aim? What is our focus? I hope it's to point others. hope it is no matter who we come in contact with it does not matter that little post don't settle for just a christian how about the actions put them to reality and let god lead us and guide us i'm going to ask you to bow your heads those at home if you would just take a moment bow your heads where you are those that are driving if you'll just listen this morning There's some challenges. Some of us are facing some challenges right now. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do inside the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God? What are you going to do? What, what about our attitude this morning? Where are you focused? I'm going to do like I did last Sunday and let the altars in here be open to the public, but I ask you to stay distance apart.
If anyone feels led to come to the altar this morning, you rise up and come this morning. If you'd like to talk later, I'd love to talk with you. If you want a message, just please do. We need your feedback. I'd love your feedback. If there's something we can pray with you about, I want to do that. What about your relationship to Jesus Christ this morning? First and foremost, how would I do that, Pastor? Would you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin this morning, to, to come into your life, to be the foundation of your life, to seize this moment, to seize this opportunity? There's no guarantee for tomorrow. You have this moment. Somebody in this building that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Pastor, I've never received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Hang around. Let me talk with you. And the ushers come to dismiss you this morning. Just say, I need to talk to the pastor. They'll get you to me. Somebody that needs to call, you can do that. Patrick can probably put my number on the screen, or you can look it up on the church website. This morning, the most important thing that can happen in your life is Jesus. Somebody said, Pastor, I know my life is based on Jesus, but I just got some issues. Would you just go before the Lord this morning? Again, if you'd love to talk or need to talk, I'd love to talk to you. I know things are a little different in social distance aspects, but I don't want you to live to leave defeated. I want you to, and I don't want you to live defeated. I want you to live victoriously. And I want you to exit this building victoriously. Let God be God. Would you do that? I'm going to let praise team lead us in a song, and then I'll close us in prayer. These altars are open if you'd like to come and kneel this morning. Kneel where you are at home or in the building. Maybe you want to pull over to the side of the road. You and God just talk to you. Listen as our praise team takes us this morning. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe. Because the God is served. God, I pray that we seize every opportunity. God, these challenges present opportunities. And I pray that we seize them, God. God, as we walk out of this building, as folks around their homes this morning, folks driving, folks in other countries and other states, God, touch them this morning. God, help us to see and aim the 
way you want us to aim, God. Lord, I pray that we'd stand on the Word of God. I pray, God, that we'd stand. I pray, God, that our attitude and our actions and our the fact that, Lord, the way we present ourselves is all about you, God. God, bless our folks today. God, bless our folks. As we're about in this world, God, give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Give us the unction of the Holy Spirit make right decisions, say right words, do right things. Godly things. That's what really matters. So God, take us on this journey. I know there's some things that's going to take place this week, God. And I pray in every one of our lives that we'd be obedient. God, we'd honor you. At the end of the day, that's all that matters, God. Thank you for the example of your word. Thank you for the obedience of your word when we speak the word of truth, that we live a life of love, that we live according to your will and to your way. Thank you this morning for all who have joined in worship. Lord Jesus, we owe it all to you.